modified Jupiter missile served as the first stage of the Army Juno-2 space probing vehicle. Built for this purpose by the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, the Jupiter was topped with upper stages and a scientific payload provided by Jet Propulsion Laboratory of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. What does this scene have to do with the quiet life of a university? How do civilian scientists in peaceful laboratories contribute to the success of missiles and rockets for the defense of our country? If you want to know, stay tuned now for The Open Window. The spinning assembly is covered during ascent through the atmosphere by a protective shroud. The first launching of Juno 2 was made on December 6, 1958. This sent a scientific probe 65,000 miles into space. The second launch in March 1959 sent the Pioneer 4 probe past the moon. It continued on its journey to become a satellite of the sun. This scientific research vehicle will continue to be used for satellite and deep space probes. The Open Window, oldest television program in the Southwest. From the University of Oklahoma, produced in the studios of WKY-TV and brought to you as a public service. Today, the Television Workshop, the Research Institute, and the United States Army Artillery and Missile Center combine to bring you a program about scientists and soldiers, brain power and firepower, big facts and big shots. The Research Institute of the University of Oklahoma and the United States Army Artillery and Missile Center at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, have combined their trained people and their knowledge to improve the accuracy and efficiency of such missiles as this one, which is standing in the reservation area of Fort Sill. The Honest John is also a free flight rocket approaching the accuracy of standard artillery weapons. The rocket is simple in design and simple to operate, having no electronic controls. It is capable of carrying both atomic and high explosive warheads. And is used tactically to provide close fire support to ground combat operations. Honest John consists of a simple rocket 21 feet long, weighing several tons, and a highly mobile self-propelled launcher the rocket has considerably more battlefield mobility than conventional artillery. One high explosive round can deliver on the target the demolition effect of hundreds of artillery shells. The weapon has been issued to troops in this country and abroad. People throughout the country know about the artillery training school at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And people throughout Oklahoma, as well as in other parts of the country, know about the stupendous research program which is going on at the University of Oklahoma, and a lot of that through the Research Institute. But not many people seem to know that there is a continuing cooperation between the military and between the civilian scientists. No one should know this better, however, and Mr. Vern Kennedy, who is director of the Research Institute at the University of Oklahoma, through whom many of these projects clear. And Colonel William A. Becker, who is director of the Office of Combat Development and Doctrine at Fort Sill. And Mr. Otis Spears, who is chief of Weapons Analysis Division of Combat Development, also at Fort Sill. Well, gentlemen, welcome to the open window to talk about this cooperation between civilian and military scientists in working on some of the problems that face artillery. Uh, let's start off with you, Colonel Becker, if you don't mind. Uh, just what is the project that's underway at Fort Sill along with Vern Kennedy's Research Institute? Let me explain just briefly uh, some of the major things going on at Fort Sill before we get into detail, Dr. Right. Lawton. Uh, Fort Sill is called the home of the U.S. Field Artillery, and this means that at Sill, we not only have 
troop units of field artillery, missiles and cannon units. This is the site of the artillery and missile school. It's also the site of an artillery replacement training center. Now, our Office of Combat Development and Doctrine is a part of the school. And the mission of our office, very briefly stated, is to keep our artillery modern. And to do this, we must improve continually the weapons and the doctrine that we have, and we must plan to develop new weapons and doctrine for the future. In doing this, we find more and more that we need scientific help in certain areas of our work. And in this area of work, OURI assists us. Mr. Spears here heads the office, uh, the Weapon System Analysis Division in our office, which coordinates this work. You see, uh, modern warfare being what it is, we can no longer afford to develop weapons in a haphazard fashion, hence the need for very careful evaluation. And here's where we do a lot of work with the Oklahoma University Research Institute. The advent of uh, nuclear warfare uh, focused our attention on uh, not only uh, computing all kinds of things regarding the efficiency of the weapon system, how long does it take to put it up, and how many people should operate it, but also the effects that we realize uh, out of it in uh, the target area. This is for now, for certainly for both nuclear and non-nuclear weapons and ammunition, which we shoot in cannons and missiles and rockets all. So we simply cannot afford chance selection of weapons anymore. It must be a coordinated scientific effort between the military and civilian scientists. And that, of course, leads directly to you, Mr. Kennedy. I understand that numbers of your projects have had to do with accuracy of weapons as well as to the destructive capacity of some of the ammunition used. Yes, Dr. Lawton, the uh, Research Institute, through the numbers of scientists and engineers that are available, to support the mission of the uh, Field Artillery School are able to bring to play modern science and technology through the university and through the people that are available. We keep a permanent staff at Fort Sill to support the mission. However, a number of the projects and problems are up, brought back to the campus for uh, study by specialists and scientists in their particular area. I suppose most people who read the newspapers are thinking in terms of research largely on uh, big missiles, intercontinental and otherwise. But a lot of your research is done with more orthodox weapons, such as the 105 howitzer. That is correct. And the cannon will be with us for some time to come, Dr. Lawton. They have a definite place in our artillery. Here we see a 105 howitzer crew preparing to fire into an experimental effects field at Fort Sill. They're firing into simu a simulated target, which represents men. One of the purposes of such firings is to determine accuracy of our weapons, the effects of our weapons, and to help us determine how many weapons we should use to attack a particular target and how much ammunition we should fire upon that target to get the desired effect. I suppose because the weapons as well as the ammunition changes all the time, there has to be continuing research. Yes, we have to keep current with the modern technology and must constantly be able to change the direction of our research to keep abreast of new weapons and new techniques that the Army requires. Well, now, uh, if you could clarify this for me a little bit. Uh, you are civilians. You are set up in Norman at the University of Oklahoma. Some personnel, both civilian and military are under a budget which comes to you where from? The uh, research work is funded from the Department of the Army and through uh, Fort Sill. Through Fort Sill. Yes. Exactly what is your setup down there at Fort Sill? We're located physically, our Office of Combat Development is located physically in the academic area of the artillery school. We occupy three of these low stature buildings you see here. Now, it's interesting to note that these are old stables that were converted when the horses left the army to office space.
inside of the weapon systems analysis building, which you see here, projects are planned, coordinated between the military and the civilian scientist. Here is Mr. Kennedy consulting with a group of uh, Oklahoma University Research Institute people and some uh, military people on a project which uh, involves experimental firing of cannons on the Fort Sill firing range. Uh, all kinds of uh, work is done here, not just ex effects experimentation. As you can see here, there are several subdivisions of the weapon systems uh, analysis uh, division. Uh, those signs uh, there are rather self-explanatory and uh, describe the kind of work that uh, each branch does. One of the amazing things about an installation such as yours is that everyone uh, has kind of a feel of its magnitude and some of the complications that must be involved. But driving along the highway, uh, one sees this, he sees the signs, but I don't think most people realize how many phases there are to the work that you have down there, Colonel. I think this is very true. Uh, we, of course, are a small part of what's going on there, but an essential part of it. Much, uh, much of our work is not only supported uh, outside by OURI, but right there on the station with troop units that are there, the other departments of the school, and we all work toward this common goal I spoke of. I know that people who live in the area are perfectly aware of the fact that you're there because they can hear the sound of artillery just about every day. How do you gentlemen go about this problem? You want to find out the uh, accuracy of weapons. You want to find out the destructive power of certain uh, types of ammunition. Uh, Mr. Spears, would you take that question, please, sir? Yes. Uh, there are quite a number of uh, sub-areas that uh, we need answers to. Uh, how, how far away from the intended point does uh, the center of a whole group of rounds fall, and how how much ca how how can we uh, what can we expect uh, out of this day in and day out? So we have to fire a large number of volleys in order to get some kind of uh, notion of what this uh, should be, so that we can predict. Well, this is one area. How does uh, atmospheric conditions affect the flight of uh, projectiles? Uh, how, how, does, how does this make uh, uh, cannon projectiles and uh, missiles, guided, uh, even guided missiles, uh, weather effects, uh, guided missile detonations? There are any number of such uh, problems as this that we have to dig into, each one of them having its own very definite implications. I think we might point out that, of course, uh, we have a great deal of knowledge in these areas and a great deal of experience from fighting wars and so forth but we find that more and more that there's much more to be learned and much more refinement to be accomplished. And I suppose that your scientists don't spend all of their time with computers and in the laboratory. Actually, the research has to start right out in the testing field, doesn't it? Yes, sir, and here we're going to see some of the actual work in the field and in the offices to follow up on some of the areas of work that we've simply outlined here in discussion. This is a 105 howitzer battery firing a pre-planned mission into an effects field, which, as Colonel Becker noted a moment ago, uh, has installations already built, simulating enemy targets uh, out there. Now, th this particular uh, project is uh, involved with some of these accuracies uh, we were talking about. What is the scatter of the shells out there? How far do we miss? These errors, by the way, are not human mistakes that we're talking about. This is inherent to the weapon, inherent to our, our ability to locate the target. After each uh, series of volleys and shells are fired into uh, any simulated enemy installation, uh, a team goes in and very carefully evaluates, looks over, 
and records what has happened. In this particular case, uh, you'll notice that they are uh, walking purposely through a target area where there is tall grass, the kind of vegetation, the kind of rolling terrain, all of this it has an effect on our fire. Uh, those uh, targets, as was mentioned uh, here a moment ago, represent standing people. Uh, we have a very definite scoring procedure, which enables us to uh, note the damage, note and record uh, the damage that uh, occurs against each target. Also, the target is very well located. It's known, it's positioned with respect to where the impact points uh, fell. As we gather this data, we have to bring it back uh, to the laboratory and to the office for processing and analysis. In this particular case, uh, we, uh, the crew has come in from firing and is beginning the long and tortuous uh, job of reconstructing scientifically the occurrences uh, that were realized out there in the target area. Uh, here, for example, uh, they are collecting uh, fragments. These fragments, there are hundreds of them, uh, come off of each uh, artillery projectile when it detonates. Uh, it's calculated in advance what we should get, what we should realize. And then here we uh, have occasion to very carefully lay out and reconstruct the incident to see how close it came to what our predictions were. For example, uh, we're fitting uh, various uh, fragments into these uh, different holes. By the way, these holes could uh, represent damage to a standing person, to a prone person, to a truck, or to any other target element that, that it might uh, strike. Each one of these is a subject of, of our calculations. Again, uh, let me emphasize the fact that the calculation here is being made regarding what? we should expect, and it is uh, of, of the utmost importance to us to find out what we actually realize as we go along in the way of errors, again, not mistakes, but, but errors inherent in the whole process itself and how we can improve it. Of course, the uh, work that is carried on at Fort Sill must be extended to cover the entire world and the different types of terrain and the different particular meteorological and geographic situations as they occur. Therefore, we must extend the work far beyond the immediate locale of this base in order to meet the overall mission of the field artillery of the United States Army. Exactly. This is done. Uh, here, for example, we examine uh, target areas for different types of terrain and different kinds of target situations that we might find the world around. In order to carry on this mission, it's necessary, of course, for close coordination between the members of Mr. Spears' staff, the members of the OURI staff, as well as the military officers. Much of this coordination is accomplished through conferences or meetings in order to uh, make sure that all members of this complex staff are aware of the overall mission and the problem. This is exactly correct. For example, here, a uh, weapons analyst outlines a project uh, or a portion of a project wherein he discusses the inherent uh, uh, errors pertaining to a certain uh, missile or cannon. If uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, cannon shells were shot at one point, uh, he's saying, uh, in effect, uh, they would pile up in some sort of a configuration like this. Uh, he does more than make general statements, however. He, he actually outlines, before any analysis of the, these experimental data are done, he outlines actual numbers to be expected. This leads us into the field of very complicated mathematical analysis that will allow the actual relationships of the effects firing in the field with the theoretical studies of the mathematicians and the scientists in the uh, technical analysis division. This is correct. Uh, when he has outlined this, and the civilians have, as it were, a model uh, made up, and the analysis is uh, then underway, the uh, military uh, officer, as noted here, 
uh, takes over and commences to uh, evaluate this in terms of tactical concepts. This then reflects in our uh, doctrine or instructional materials, uh, that is, the actual teaching uh, procedures are modified by everything that goes on here uh, between the military and the civilian scientists. Well, gentlemen, I want to ask you a question, but I don't want to make it an embarrassing one because I realize you're not going to say anything that's classified on this program. But what have you found out through this cooperative research? What are some of the things you've learned? Among other things, <coughs> Dr. Lawton, we have learned just very recently in our experiments that we should modify the fuses on some of our ammunitions to get better effect from them. Mr. Spears, I'm sure, can enumerate others. There have been any a number, number of uh, concrete results coming off this uh, cooperative effort. Uh, for example, uh, the slide rule you noted there a few minutes ago uh, shows very quickly how much ammunition should be planned from either a missile or a cannon uh, uh, unit in order to achieve a given mission. Well, although you use a great many conventional weapons, uh, in your research, I suppose the things that would apply to something conventional like the Howitzer 105 would also have applications for some of the big missiles, guided or otherwise. Is that true? It does, and as a matter of fact, uh, this leads into these new developments I speak of uh, in consideration there. Yes, indeed. The, uh, le let us not give the impression that all of our work is done around uh, 105 Howitzers. Uh -huh. You are very, uh, you put it very well when you say this kind of work applies right across the board to yes. uh, missiles, new and uh, existing. Of course, what the general public uh, thinks about and what it gets imaginative about are, are some of these big, impressive uh, air defense things. Uh, for example, the one at Fort Bliss that they've done so much work with is what, the Hawk? The Hawk. Perhaps I should clarify a bit the distinction between air defense artillery and field artillery. Yes. Now, we've been talking about field artillery. The artillery arm of the U.S. Army includes, as well, air defense artillery. And its home, uh, if we may call it that, is at Fort Bliss, Texas. Their mission is to attack targets in the air. Ours is to attack targets on the ground. One the of those, for example, would be the Hawk. The Hawk is a good example. missile is a versatile air defense system designed to reinforce the low altitude capability of United States air defenses. It can destroy attackers flying at even treetop level in addition to engaging jet aircraft at higher ranges. The missile is powered by a solid fuel propellant. It is about 16 feet long and 14 inches in diameter. Hawk is highly mobile, capable of being moved over the highway by aircraft or even by helicopter. It can also be used at fixed sites for defense of key military and industrial targets. Sites have been selected for the emplacement of the Hawk in the New York City and Washington Baltimore areas. Well, Colonel Fort Sill is essentially a, a school, a training school, isn't it? Well, one of the major elements is the artillery and missile school, but there's much more yes, to it I than that, of course. But it is the training ground for artillerymen, artillery officers. And your men down there get training in handling a lot of these big missiles right up to the point of firing. That's true. Of course, our longer range missiles, we simply run out of range at Fort Sill. And this firing, service practice we call it, is performed at White Sands near the Fort Bliss complex. By the same men that you have trained. That's correct. Uh, Colonel, uh, since you handle primarily ground-to-ground uh, -ground missiles, am I using the, the correct term there? Well, surface to surface. Surface we to surface. We're just saying field artillery missiles. Uh -huh. and, and you call these, these missiles uh, that aren't fired out of uh, a barrel, you, you still call those field artillery if they're surface to surface. That's correct. Uh, what are the some of the ones that you do handle down there, the corporal? We have corporal, which will soon be replaced by what we will be called the sergeant missile. Also, the redstone missile is at Fort Sill, as well as our free flight rockets, Honest John and Little John.
The Corporal is a ballistic missile designed to give the field commander far greater firepower on the battlefield and to enable him to strike selected targets deep in the enemy rear areas. Weather and visibility conditions place no restriction on the use of the weapon. Motive power is supplied by a powerful liquid rocket motor. The slender 45 foot long corporal is carried into the field on a self-propelled hydraulically operated erector. Other ground equipment includes fuel trucks, storage tanks, and a movable servicing platform. The missile is equipped with either an atomic or conventional warhead. The Sergeant ballistic missile was designed to replace the corporal, outperforming the corporal in power, accuracy, and mobility. The overall length of the sergeant is 30 feet. It can deliver a nuclear warhead far behind enemy lines, and its highly accurate guidance system is invulnerable to any known countermeasures. The solid propellant motor has better performance and storage capabilities than those of many other weapons. The sergeant can be quickly emplaced and fired by a small crew under all conditions of weather and terrain. The missile and all its ground equipment can easily be moved by standard army vehicles. It is extremely simple to maintain and fire. The Redstone is the Army's 200-mile surface-to-surface ballistic missile, developed entirely by the scientific and technical team of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency to extend and supplement the range and firepower of artillery cannon. The Army's largest weapon is completely invulnerable to any external effort to upset or to interfere with its highly developed precise guidance system. It travels at supersonic velocity. It will follow a pre-planned trajectory carrying a nuclear warhead. The Redstone, 69 feet long and 70 inches in diameter, uses alcohol as fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer. For firing, the missile, its launching equipment, and fuel are quickly moved to a launch site in a truck convoy. It is raised to the vertical firing position by lightweight equipment. Well, Colonel Baker, if you are going to summarize the importance of this research work between Fort Sill and the OU Research Institute, what would you say? Well, the things we've been discussing is the narrow field of activity at, at Fort Sill. It's a very important one, we feel. Eight years of collaboration with OURI and more than 40 major projects accomplished by OUR have convinced us of the worth of it. And I think it's the most economical way that we can get the type of support that we need in our effort. Well, Colonel and Mr. Spears, Mr. Kennedy, you're doing a terrifically important job. I think even a layman and a civilian can realize, and also one that intrigues the imagination. We thank all three of you gentlemen for appearing on the Open Window program today to talk about this significant research work coming through the OU Research Institute. And we're glad to have had you with us today, too. And we hope you'll be back with us again two weeks from today for another look through the Open Window. The Open Window from the University of Oklahoma is under the supervision of Sherman P. Lawton. The Open Window today acknowledges the cooperation of the Research Institute of the University of Oklahoma and the U.S. Army Artillery and Missile Center. Guests on today's program were Mr. Vern Kennedy, Colonel William A. Becker, and Mr. Otis Spears. Join us two weeks from today when the Open Window takes us through another look through the Open Window. <laughs>